Hello everyone, in this video we're going to derive the general condition for hydrostatic equilibrium in vector form. Now what does hydrostatic equilibrium actually mean? It just refers to the situation where you have a fluid whose internal forces due to pressure variations within the fluid are set up in just the right way to counteract the force of gravity such that each fluid element has a resultant force of zero. So I've already written out the equation that we're aiming to derive which is that the gradient of the pressure in the fluid is equal to the local density multiplied by the local gravitational field strength. Now I'm going to choose to work in a Cartesian coordinate system for this derivation but what you've got to bear in mind is that we're going to derive a vector equation and vector equations are coordinate system independent so you could do the same derivation in cylindrical coordinates or spherical coordinates or whatever coordinate system you like and you would end up with the same result and because that result has to be coordinate system independent we may as well choose the coordinate system that makes our life as easy as possible when we are doing the derivation. I think it is worth mentioning that I've seen quite a lot of derivations around for this equation or related equations that try to use spherical volume elements, which end up at the correct answer, but they have conceptual mistakes in the working that just happened to cancel out. So my point there is, I think it's best to stick to Cartesian coordinates because it's pretty easy to mess this up in other coordinate systems. So I've already sketched out our Cartesian fluid element, which of course is just a cuboid, and we've got our set of Cartesian axes x, y, and z, and I'm going to say that the far left hand face of our fluid element is just at an x coordinate of x, and the far right hand face has an x coordinate of x plus dx, meaning that the length of the side of the cuboid in the x direction is just dx, and then of course we can do the same thing for the vertical side, call that dy and we'll call the length of the side going into the screen dz. I'm using this notation of dx dy dz uh, just to highlight that we're considering an infinitesimally small volume element and we're eventually going to take the limit as those lengths go towards zero. So we need to identify all of the forces acting on our fluid element. There is of course going to be a force acting inwards on each of the six faces of that cuboid coming from the pressure of the surrounding fluid. For example on the left hand face there is a rightwards force coming from that pressure and and pressure is force per unit area so if you want to know how big that force is you would take the pressure at that local position within the fluid and multiply it by the area of the face that it's acting on. Now the pressure is going to be a function of position in space so all three coordinates x y and z and so I'm going to write down the pressure as p of x y and z and then the area of that face that it's acting on is just dy times dz because it's just a rectangle and so I'm going to put a dy dz there so that is the size of the force pushing to the right on that face by the same logic you have an opposite force pushing in on the far right hand side face there is going to be one important difference which is that we're going to allow the pressure to vary in space and so p of x y z is not the same as the pressure acting over on the right hand side now as you go from the left hand face to the right hand face you're not changing y and z coordinates you're just moving along the x-axis so what I'm going to do is write that pressure as p of x plus dx because we're at a new x coordinate now but we still keep the dy and dz the same and of course um, it's a cuboid and so the area of that face is still the same it's just dy dz and of course you can repeat that same analysis in the y direction and the z direction you're going to have six arrows pushing inwards on all of the faces I'm not going to write those all on because the diagram is going to get pretty crowded but you get the idea other than those pressure forces what else do we have well we have a gravitational force if there's a gravitational field present and that could be acting in any arbitrary direction we want to keep things general and so I'm just going to draw a random arrow going down like that. Now to get the size of that gravitational force, otherwise known as just the weight of the fluid element, we need to take the gravitational field strength vector and multiply it by the mass of our fluid element. So notationally we could just write that down as g of r, where r is the position vector x, y, z. So again we're allowing the gravitational fields to vary in space and we're going to multiply that by the mass of the element which we may as well call dm. Now remember that our fluid element is in equilibrium meaning that the forces in any given direction are balanced and so we're going to start by considering the balance of forces in the x direction in particular and that will then straightforwardly generalize to the y and z directions as well. So the condition is that the x components of all of the forces sum to zero let's express that as an equation you have a component of the pressure force which is always acting to the right which is this thing over here so I'm going to start by writing down p of x, y, z, d, 
dy dz. Then you have the one on the other side, this one over here, which is going to get a minus sign because it's always pointing to the left. So I'm going to do minus p of x plus dx y z dy dz. Then we have to add on the x component of the gravitational force. So I'm going to write that down as plus g subscript x, the x component of g, multiplied by the element of mass dm. Notice that even though I put a plus sign in front of that term, that doesn't imply that the g vector is always pointing to the right, because gx itself can be either positive or negative. So the sign of gx determines what direction the x component of that force is actually acting in. We can go one step further and express the mass element dm in terms of the length elements dx, y, and z, because we have the relationship mass equals density times volume. And so I could just replace that dm with rho, which could vary with positions, and it's a function of x, y, and z, uh, multiplied by the volume, but it's a cuboid, and so the volume is just dx, dy, dz. And then that is all of the x components of the forces added together, so we set that to be zero. Now this equation would probably look a bit neater if we could make some of those differential terms disappear. So a nice way to do that is to divide everything by dx, dy, dz. What's that going to do to the first term? It will cancel out the dy, dz and put dx on the denominator. The same thing is going to happen to the second term. And so we can write those first two terms as p of x, y, z minus p of x plus dx, y, z. Then we divide that whole thing by dx and we're just left with the second term, which is now uh, just plus gx rho, that's all equal to zero. Now notice that the form of that first fractional term in our equation is very much like the definition of the derivative of p with respect to x, except the two terms on the numerator are the wrong way around compared with how they should be if that was actually a derivative. So what we can do is take the limit as dx goes towards zero because we're considering an infinitesimal element and then write that first fraction as not just dp by dx but minus dp by dx because the terms on the numerator are the wrong way around and then we've still got our gx row that doesn't change that's still equal to zero and then you may as well get rid of the minus sign by putting the two terms on different sides and you conclude that the derivative of p with respect to x is rho times the x component of g. Now we've only considered the balance of forces in the x direction but it's pretty straightforward to see that the derivation would be exactly the same for y and z. And so the equivalent equation for forces in the y direction would just replace this x with a y, this x with a y, and same for z. That follows from the symmetry of the problem. So what you can then do is the thing that I've done here and combine the three results in the x, y, and z directions into a single vector equation. That vector equation is really like three scalar equations in one because each row of the vectors um, define a separate equation. Now the shorthand notation for that vector equation at the bottom there um, is of course the gradient of p, right? This vector here is just the definition of grad p. The right hand side is of course just rho times the g vector and we've derived the equation that we set out to derive. Now I'd like to stress that this grad p equals rho g result is quite a powerful result and writing it in that way is not just a notational convenience to save you from having to write out three separate components, right? That final step that we did was making the leap from a coordinate based form of the equations to a coordinate independent form of the equations, which goes back to what I was saying at the beginning. So we can apply that gradient equation in any coordinate system we like. Finally, let's just think about the physical meaning of this equation, make sure that it actually makes sense and that we haven't got plus and minus signs wrong or anything like that. Remember that the gradient of a scalar field, such as this grad p term here, is pointing in the direction of greatest increase of the scalar field. So what this equation is then telling us is that the direction of greatest increase of the pressure within the fluid is the same as the direction of the local gravitational field, because grad p is parallel to g. That's actually quite physically intuitive because it's telling you that the pressure has to be increasing in the direction of the local gravitational field because the pressure gradient has to support the fluid against the pull of gravity. So in my next video, I'm going to apply this equation to a particular problem, um, and we're going to find the pressure as a function of distance from the center of a spherical planet. So thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next time.